be seated this morning. It's good to have you in the house of God. I'm going to be a little bit different service for us today than normally. We're going to take a break from studying our way through the Gospel of Luke. We're going, we're working our way through the Bible, and we're Sunday mornings in the Gospel of Luke. But uh, with the events and the activities and stuff going on in the world, uh, especially Thursday night in Dallas, and just just the craziness that's going on, I like so many other people have been very troubled about what's what's happening and what do we do as Christians and, and how do we act what's you guys kind of understand what I mean you just kind of feel almost numb and but but no we need to do something what do we do right well today I want to just kind of share my heart a little bit with you I do have some notes but many of you know I don't even use notes when I have an outline but uh, I think I want to share some things with you today that might help and to start off uh, for the overhead if you would please, Bonnie, Romans chapter 12, verse 21, gives us a very, very powerful, powerful portion of scripture. It says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. A lot of evil going around in the world, right? But love conquers all, we learn from 1 Corinthians. And having said that, I've got a couple of scriptures I want you to find and mark in your Bible if you'd put those up there, the finds. Our, our main text today will be out of 2 Chronicles 15, and then we'll be reading some scriptures out of Romans 13. Go ahead and find those. You notice that I've asked the worship team to remain up here just for a few moments, because we're going to have a special time of prayer. You guys got those two? Okay. A couple other scriptures I'm going to put up before we actually dive into it. Uh, very familiar scripture. We've been saying it a lot recently. But if you'd put it up there, Bonnie, Second Chronicles 7.14. Very powerful for you and I. Very powerful. God is speaking and God says, if my people, all right, friends, he's not talking to sinners. He's not talking to the pagans. He's not talking to the unrighteous. In a world going crazy, God speaks to his people. And he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, God says, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Friends, our land needs healing, right? right? People need Jesus Christ more than ever. Amen? And then secondly, if you put up there, Bonnie, 2 Samuel 24, 25 says and this is this is awesome uh, David built an altar to the Lord and he offered burnt offerings and peace offerings he he gave all these sacrifices and all these offerings because the land was troubled now the reason the land was troubled was because of David and because of the sin of the people and because of all this stuff that was going on and and they were seeking God for this and David is is offering offerings and it says so the Lord heeded the prayers for the land and the plague was withdrawn from Israel. Friends, we as the people of God, we need to start praying and pouring our hearts out for our nation, for our people, for our land. Would you agree with that? All right, I'm going to do something that's different for us, but I'm going to ask all of you to stand, and we're going to have a, a word of prayer for our nation and for our people. This isn't a time thing. I don't know how it's going to go, but I'm just going to ask that you guys uh, turn around and, and form little prayer circles with those around you. I've got uh, Gilbert, Andrew, uh, Liz, Kelly, everyone is here. Let's just form some little circles here. And let's, in, just in your own words, uh, it's not a time thing. I'm not going to lead you. Let's pray for our nation. And as God moves you, as the Holy Spirit leads and guides, lift up our voices to the Lord.
conclude our prayers, we can just make our way back to our seats, remaining in an attitude of worship and prayer. in the Lord. You may be seated this morning. As uh, we kick off, I want to ask a question. How do you move a mountain? Answer, one truckload at a time, right? Right? But well, we have this mountain in front of us, friends. Of course, the, the biggest part of that mountain is sin. We've got the enemy of our souls after us. We have a hate and discontention, and it's all part of Satan's plan to divide and conquer, right? And just, just evilness. But what do we do? Well, I believe uh, God can share some things with us this morning from his word. So if you would open your Bibles, our main text is going to be 2 Chronicles chapter 15. 2 Chronicles 15. And I want to give you the background of what's going on here. The nation was in trouble. Israel has been split. They are now, they were one nation, God's country. They are now split into two. They have Judah and they have Israel. The king of Judah is a man by the name of Asaph. And he's our main principle that we're going to be looking at today. But the nation, the reason it was in trouble was because Solomon, who was the richest king ever, right? I don't think he was as great a king as his father David, but some people says that he was or maybe even better. Well, Solomon, during Solomon's reign, the nation of Israel's borders were the largest they had ever been. They were the wealthiest nation that had ever been. All this stuff was going on, except there was a little problem. Solomon allowed foreigners to come in and to to bring their pagan idol worship. He, he started marrying women that, that led him into worshiping these idols. And friends, when we start messing with the world, our world will start crumbling, right? And so we see that by the time that, that uh, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, becomes king, the nation is divided. He divides the nation, and it's just, they're a mess. They are absolutely a mess. And then when Asa comes into power, he has received this world that is crumbling to pieces. Now, diagnosis always comes before a cure, right? So in this chapter, let's look and see what the three main problems were in his world. And I think they have a direct correlation with what's going on in our world. And uh, then we're going to see what God does to fix it. And friends, how many of you know that if we apply the principles of God to our life today, God will still fix things? right? So let's look at this. Diagnosis comes before a cure. Look at verse 3. It says, uh, for a long time Israel, here's the first thing, had been without the true God. You see what the problem was, is the people of that day, thanks to Solomon, and it just it made its way through down to where they were in this day, is the people started looking to man, to the king, not to God, the king of kings. They started wanting man to take care of them. And they started to, to boot God out of the place. And all of a sudden now, it took many years 
But the true God is not being proclaimed in the nation, and the nation is falling around, falling apart. I don't want to get political. Uh, I definitely am not politically correct. But can I just say this very boldly, that we started doing this in 1962 when we kicked God out of our public schools. And now after many years, 50, 54 years, because that's when I was born. <laughs> yeah. How old am I? Oh, I thought you said 52. I'd get excited there. I was like, man, I gained two years. Right on, right on. But we can see the decline of our nation from when we took God away from children. Right? And now we have a godless nation. God has always had his remnant, and he still has his remnant. And what King Ace is going to do here is he's going to cause that remnant to, to get together. And they're going to do some great and powerful things, and they're going to change their world. But the first problem was, and, and we have it here, is that they, the true God wasn't in Israel anymore. And friends, we've got a lot of gods, but we need to have the true God. Let me just offend some people here. People make God out of money. People make God out of hobbies. People make God out of self. The Bible says in the last days people will be lovers of themselves. Right? I mean, we have a lot of gods. But the true God of Israel was no longer in Israel. Friends, we've got to get back to God. The second problem that they had, still in verse 3 here, they were without teaching priest. Ouch. They had a lot of priests. But they weren't teaching the true and full and complete word of God. Friends, that's happening in our world today. We've got buildings full of motivational speakers. But very few people teach the uncompromised, unpolluted word of God. I got a great scripture for the overhead, please, Bonnie. 2 Timothy 4.3. We see this happening. God said it was going to happen, so we shouldn't be shocked. Paul tells young Timothy, preach the word. Not your thoughts, not public opinion. Preach the word of God and be ready in season and out of season. Right? That means whatever season, you preach the word of God. Right? When things are going good, preach the word. When things are going bad, preach the word. All the time. Our, our job is the word. Convince, rebuke, ex exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Notice this. This time is with us today. For the time will come. It's here today, friends. It is here, I'm telling you. When they will not endure sound doctrine. How many of you... Hear TV preachers preaching about holiness, rejecting sin, and living right. Men love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for them. Right? <laughs> People are giving elbows over here. <laughs> they won't endure sound teaching. They won't endure sound doctrine. But look at, remember I said the God of self? But according to their own desires... I love babies. Because they have itching ears, it means they, they want them tickled. Right? We, we want to put a stamp of approval on our bad behavior. Yeah. <laughs> they will heap up for themselves teachers. You know, you can, you pay enough money, you get someone to tell you whatever you want to hear. Has anyone ever, okay, don't raise your hand. <laughs> Has, any, has anyone ever heard of someone go to a palm reader and getting good news? You pay them enough money, they'll tell you whatever you want to hear, right? Same with preachers. You give them enough money when they pass the plate. Hey, they'll tell you. Hey, you do, yeah, right? They'll tell you what your, your itching ears want to hear. Friends, that was going on in that day, and it's going on in our day. Are we so shocked that our, 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 our nation is in the moral decline that it's in? Because we've gotten rid of the true God. We don't teach the true word. And look at, look at this last thing. Here, still in verse 3. And without law. Let me just kind of bring that in today's terms. The FBI is letting criminals free. Department of Justice is, 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 is penalizing the innocent and elevating the guilty. They're without law. Can we make any applications to our world today? Asa, he 
He inherited world, this broken, broken system. And friends, we find ourselves in a broken world, in a broken system, but there is hope. And we're going to learn from this portion of Scripture here how to go about it. Uh, if, so if, if you all are with me, let's start back it up a little bit, and let's start at verse 1. I don't think this is going to be a long message, but uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Chapter 15, verse 1. Now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Obed. Azariah was the prophet. Now he was alone. He wasn't very popular, but the Spirit of God came upon him. Here's our first point. If you're making notes, how to move a mountain. Okay, remember, one truckload at a time. How to fix our nation. How to, how to heal the wounds. Now this... These principles will go to whatever mountains in your life. Jesus said, you know, if you speak to the mountain, it'll be removed. There are some people here facing today uh, a mountain of a, of a bad relationship, a mountain of bad finances. There are a lot of mountains, right? Well, all of these principles can be applied to our lives, right? So here's the first one. It's time for the people of God to speak up. It's time for the people of God to speak up. Azariah was outnumbered. He was outmanned. He was outgunned. But the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him, and he marches to the king, right? And he speaks out to the king. As we move into verse 2, here's the second point. The second point is listen to the right voice. Look at verse 2. And he went out, and he met Asa, and he said unto him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. We must listen to the right voice. Rehoboam listened to the advice of his buddies. Rehoboam was Solomon's son who caused the nation to be divided. He went, when, when his dad died and he became the king, he went to his buddies and he says, uh, Man, dad's rich, but I want to be richer. What do we need to do? And his buddies told him, Hey, tax the people even more. Take their stuff away from them. Okay? You, you give them what they need. He, he was working on the Bernie Sanders system. I told you this is going to upset some people, but it will heal your world. So then Rehoboam went to the wise older men and said, what do we need to do? Because there was already some trouble and some, some tension in the land. And they said, you need to seek God and you need to, you need to let, let the people be the people again. You need to ease up on them. You need to encourage them. He says, nah, I'd rather tax them and divide. I would rather sell out my people for my comfort than to let the people rise up. Does that sound like some politicians today? Boy, God could have wrote this book today, right? Instead of thousands of years ago. So we must listen to the right voice. Friends, there's a lot of voices out there telling you which way you should think, how you should live, but they're not the right voice. We need to listen to the voice of God. Second thing, or the third thing also in verse 2 is we need to move with God, not against God. Verse 2 here is a good life verse if you're looking for a life verse. For the Lord is with you while you are with him. Friends, that promise is just as, as true today for you and I as it was for Asa. And God will be found. Do you, you feel lost like God is far away? Kind of check on your, on your dedication to him. How, how's your prayer life doing? He'll be found. But if you forsake God, he'll forsake you. That's a strong one, isn't it? The fourth point here is verses 3 through 7. Consequences follow our behavior. Let's read all these and we'll come back. Verse 3. For a long time Israel had been without the true God, without teaching priests, and without law. But, when their but in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him and was found by them. And, those, and in those times there was no peace to the one who went out nor to the one who came in. But great turmoil was on all the inhabitants of the land. Boy, is that verse not applicable to our world today. There's no peace. There's great troubling and turmoil when you go out and all this stuff. Verse 6, so the nation was destroyed by nation and city by city. For God troubled them with every adversity. But you be strong and do not let your hands be weak for your work shall be rewarded. Once again, consequences follow our behavior. Without God, chaos and confusion and fear will reign. But with God, we bring peace and comfort. Let's look a little closer at these verses. Verse 4 says, again, but in their trouble they turn to the Lord. Here's the next point. Don't waste your pain. 
Don't waste your pain. Remember the very short-lived revival after 9-11? Let's do our part to, to use these tragedies, these sad events, to bring the message of Jesus Christ to the hurting world. Now, I can't answer all the questions, but I know the one who can, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's not waste our pain, right? Let's not waste it. Uh, uh, once again, verse 5 is that very descriptive verse for us today. Let's drop down uh, verse 7. Here's our next point, point number 6, if you're making notes. And that is, uh, be strong. Look what it says in verse 7. But you, be strong. And do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. Okay, be strong. Don't let the craziness in the world stop you. Be sure that, that what you're doing is not for naught. It's not in vain. There will be a reward friends we need like I said in the beginning we need to speak up as the children of God we need to bring the message of hope to the hurting world you guys agree with that verse 8 is is our seventh point here and that is believe the word of God oh how I push this in in our church right Look at verse 8. And when Asa heard the words and the prophecy of Obed the prophet, he took courage. That means that he believed what he said and it, it encouraged him. We must be doers of the word and not hearers only. He took, took courage. Over and over, the people of God were told by God to be strong and be courageous. Joshua was told that when he led the children of Israel in. I think it's like six times in the first chapter he was told to be strong and courageous. Why does God keep telling us that? Because sometimes following God is scary. Right, going into some of these situations can be a little, uh, little nerve-wracking for us. But God says, "Hey, I got your back. You be strong. You be courageous. You do this." Uh, so it says he took courage. I'm still in verse eight, and look what he did. This is, this is the next point. He got back to righteousness, friends. We desperately, desperately need this. Look what he did. He removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from their cities, which he had taken into the mountains of Ephraim. And he, uh, and he restored the altar of the Lord that was in the vestibule of the Lord. Very important two points here. The first one was he got back to righteousness. Friends, the Bible says that it's righteousness, not wickedness, that exalts a nation. He rid the land of idols. And friends, we must do the same. And, and what I'm talking about here is we've got to start in our own lives, in our own homes, in our own communities, in our own churches. We've got a lot of idols. Kind of like having a lot of gods. There's a lot of things that we put, put ahead of, of the Lord in our life. And the greatest God, the greatest idol that competes with the Lord Jesus is, is self. See, Jesus says, take up the cross and follow me. We say, I don't want nothing with the cross. You follow me, Jesus. Let's be honest. Right? He rid the land of idols. Now, we as a people, our land is filled with a lot of abominable idols. Can I continue to be honest with you guys? Our nation has got some very, very deep sins that we have turned into idols. We slaughter by the millions unborn children. And we make it, we give a free pass for it. Now that is not the unpardonable sin and God can heal and restore any hurt from any, any of that activity. But friends, as a nation, we allow that to happen and we promote it to happen and our government pays to allow that to happen. That is an idol, a sick, wicked idol that we as a nation need to be, be uh, cleaned up. We, we parade perversity and call it right. We celebrate wickedness and call it freedom. Friends, it disgusts our Lord and it is hurting our nation. It's affecting our families and it's destroying us as a people. Would you agree with that? He rid the land of idols. That wasn't an easy thing. It took him years to do that. But friends, our little voice 
can make a powerful effect if we will quit being quiet as Christians. Now, we don't go out and cause trouble and scream and yell like, like the pagan people are doing, and right? We do it with love. We, we saw that in the first thing. We overcome darkness and evilness with love, right? But we need to do something. And we can do something. Let's keep going. The second thing he did, very important. This really jumped out at me. Still in verse 8. He restored the altars of God that was in the vestibule of the Lord. We must get back to God as individuals, as families, as a church, as a nation. For only God can heal our nation. Only God can break racism and prejudices. Only God, the God of the Bible, can do all of that. I would challenge you to make a new, fresh commitment. We'll see they did that farther down in this chapter. But can I just give you an encouragement, a Pastor Clay encouragement. I encourage you to make a commitment to read one chapter of the Bible every day. Right? It's amazing the change it'll do in your life. Right? Just one, one little chapter a day. And you know what will happen is you'll find yourself getting, getting so hungry for the Word of God, you'll just eat it up. It's awesome. It's awesome. But we need to get back. Our, our world needs to get back. Our church needs to get back. Notice the altar was there, but it was neglected. It wasn't used. It was in, sitting in the vestibule, but it was nothing more than, than some old relic. Fire had gone out. No sacrifices upon it. Friends, maybe you feel like the altar of your heart has been neglected, like the fire has gone out. You can fix it today. God wants to reignite that fire, that passion for him in you. Amen? Let's keep moving. Point number 10. I think I've only got 50 points, so you guys are doing all right. Point number 10 is in verse 9. This is very strong, too. There must be unity among believers. Look at verse 9. Then they gathered all Judah and Benjamin and those who dwelt with them from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon. For they came over to him in great numbers from Israel when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. Friends, the churches have got to stop being a divided house. We've got to quit having an us-against-them attitude with the churches down the street. Now, I'm not talking about people who teach heresy and, and have a false God. I'm talking about people who claim Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, right? We need to come together as believers and, and, and quit the pettiness, and let's focus on the job that God has for us. Amen? Does that sound good? And uh, also notice that when God starts doing something in your life, the people will notice and come to you. People from the Israel side saw that God was moving on the Judah side, and so they started coming over. You start allowing God to use you and to move in you and to, and to, to work through you. People will notice, and they'll come to you, right? And you can tell them, the Jehovah God of the Bible is doing this. Amen? Cool, let's keep going here. Um, I'm kind of losing my spot. What number was that, Mark? Ten? Okay, point 11, verse 9. Don't be afraid to be a leader. Don't be afraid to be a leader. That goes with that. Asa made bold moves to pursue God, and the people responded. Let me take a moment to challenge the men here today. Men, God has called you to be the leaders of your house. Start being that leader that God wants you to be. Now, I understand there are family dynamics where that can't happen. Gals, you've got to be the spiritual leader. If that's your situation, you be the leader. But we need to start being leaders, amen? We need to start, uh, uh, and it's got to start in our own life. We've got to let God be our personal leader so we can be the leader God has called us to be in our families, right? Point number 12. Man, I'm zipping along. Point number 12, verse 10, kind of goes back with, with it. This also has to do with unity, come together in unity. Look at verse 10. So they gathered together at Jerusalem in the third month in the 15th year of the reign of Asa. Now, notice it's taken him 15 years. Sometimes it's a slow process moving a mountain. But it's got to be steady. It's got to be continuous. You've got to keep going. Amen? And so, uh, finally it happened. This will become known as the Feast of Pentecost here. They all gathered together. They came in unity. Disunity is what the devil is doing to our country. And friends, trust me, it's Satan that is dividing us because a house divided will fall. Evil, hate, and discontention for our, our fellow brothers and sisters is from the devil. Right? And we need unity. We need unity. 
Number 13, verse 11. Remember to worship. Check out verse 11. And they offered to the Lord at that time 700 bulls and 7,000 sheep from the spoil that they had brought. What I mean by this is they have been worshiping. They had returned to worship 15 years now. They've been worshiping God. But here they did a super worship. And here's what my challenge to you is, is, is ramp up your worship. Be more committed to worshiping God. Even in troubled times, don't stop worshiping the Lord. One of the worst things we can do when trouble happens, and it happens all the time, is when troubles start happening, people, instead of going to God, they move away from God. Right? When, when there's trouble in your house and turmoil in your life, friends, you need to be at the house of God, not away from God. Right? And so they beefed up their worship. It was awesome. They all came together. They had this great thing going. Verse 12, uh, verse 12 is our our 14th point and this just kind of goes with us they they renewed their covenant their commitment to God look at verse 12 then they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their hearts and with all their souls man they gave a hundred percent dedication most of us are we're pretty good at, at serving and seeking the Lord and attending church and stuff and unless the cardinals are in town because you know Okay, I won't step on any more toes. Yes, I will. <laughs> verse 15, this is one of those and wild verses. would not Look seek the three. Lord God of Israel was put to death. Now, we're not called to kill nobody. Right? <laughs> Can you imagine us having someone at the door? Okay, why weren't you here last week? <laughs> I just had visions. So what does this mean to you and I today? Well, what this means to you and I today is there might be some people, some places, some activities that we need to put to death in our life. And I'm not talking physical death like killing somebody. But I mean, we might be involved in some activities and stuff that's not healthy for us. We got to nail those to the cross and turn them over to the Lord. You guys know what I mean? So there are some things, and it might be a person, it might be an activity, it might be a hobby, it, might, it could be anything that we might need to eliminate from our life because it's keeping us from God. Notice it was, whether great or small, whether man or woman, one of the deadly things about sin is a lot of people like to keep pet sins, don't we? Because they're little and they're cute. Psalms 91, I think it's verse 15. I think, let me, I'm inspired. Let me turn over here. Yes, Psalm 91, look at verse 13. I was right, wow. It says, you shall tread upon the lion and the cobra and the young lion and the serpent and you shall trample them underfoot. Now this is very interesting because this paints a picture of those things in our life that can cause us trouble. It's a picture of sin. You shall tread upon, you shall have victory over the lion. What is the lion? Well, the lion's those big sins that, that you see coming at you, right? You can hear the growl, you can hear the roar. You have a, the lion's coming at you, you know it, right? My dad had lions, and you know it when they're coming after you, right? And <laughs> yeah, I won't tell you those stories. But also, you'll tread upon the cobra. What's the cobra? The cobra are those, those slithering sins that you don't see, and you just kind of maybe stumble upon, and they, they bite you, right? I mean, people sin. It's not like you wake up in the morning and think, you know what, I'm going to go and just commit a sin today. I just, today feels like Sin Tuesday. I'm, that's what I'm going to do. But something happens, right? And we get bit by the cobra, right? But look at this next one. The young lion and the serpent. If you got the King James Bible, that, that second serpent there is actually the word dragon. What's the dragon? Well, the dragon are those 
those mind things that happen to us. That's why we're to control our minds. That's why we're to take our thoughts captives, right? Because we feed our minds with all these things that we shouldn't be feeding them and they can go different places. But what I, what I want to highlight here is this young lion. Young lions are cute. Right? You just want to wrestle them and, right? I know, we've had them. They're cute. And young lions are like little pet sins. They're, they're cute and they're fun to play with. But little lions grow up to be big lions. And before you know it, they'll bite you. And friends, that's what sin will do. We, we play with little pet sins and, and we encourage them and, and they're fun and they're cute and they're cuddly, right? But one day they'll bite you. Now for those of you that don't know, I carry lion mark scars in a particular part of my body that you will never see unless you're an embalmer. <laughs> but lion cubs bite too. Lion cubs bite too. So whether they were, I'm back in my text, whether they were great or small, these people were, were, were put out. And so we need to examine our lives. Are, are we entertaining a sin or something in our life that's going to hinder our work and our life for God? Is this making sense, you guys? Almost done. We really are. We really are. Verse 14. Then they took an oath before the Lord with a loud voice, with shouting and with trumpets and ram's horn. Here's, here's number 16, verse 14, loud voice. Friends, uh, uh, no matter what the time, our voices need to be heard as Christians, especially in our community. We're letting people who are so far and foreign from God tell us what to do and make our laws and doing all this stuff. We as the people of God, we got to let our voices be heard to make a change. Amen? Um, Number 17, verse 15, this is great. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath that they had sworn with all their hearts and they sought him with all of their souls. Now notice this, and he was found by them. They, they, they desperately needed God and they desperately sought God and, and God showed up in a big way. And look what happens. They found him and the Lord gave them rest. Your Bible might even say the word peace. It's the, it's the uh, Hebrew word there that can be used for either of them. God showed up and gave them the peace they were looking for. God showed up and gave them the rest they were looking for. God showed up and did the great things and brought the nation back together. He says he gave them peace all around them. Friends, this, only this true rest, only the true peace can be found only through our Lord Jesus Christ. For the overhead, please, Bonnie, John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Talking about the creation of our wonderful world here. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Friends, the answer to our dark world is the light of Jesus Christ. And we are called to be the light bearers. We're the ones to do it. We're the ones to go out. But we got to let our voices be heard. We got we to gotta stand the moral ground, right? We're the ones called to do it. Now, uh, I asked you to, to um, find Romans 13. I'm going to bring all this to a conclusion. And the people said... <laughs> You got your fingers there marking Romans 13? I want to read one more verse in Second Chronicles 15. Then, then we can just turn and leave our Bibles to Romans. Um, let's finish reading the chapter. Just a couple more verses. Second Chronicles 15 and then we'll do it. Look at verse 16. And he, this is the king, also, also removed Mechaniah. I'm not sure how you say her name. But she was his mom the mom of the king, he removed her from being queen mother because she had made an obscene image of Asterisk and Asa cut down her obscene image and crushed it and burned it by the book Kindra. You know, sometimes uh, when we make a stand for righteousness, when we make a stand for God, it's not going to please everybody. 
But we've got to draw that line in the sand and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And if you don't like it, right? Verse 17. Uh, then the, but the high places were not removed from Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was loyal in all his days. Check out verse 18. And he brought in, and he also brought into the house of God the things that his father had dedicated and that he himself had dedicated silver and gold and utensils. So he restored the temple to, to its full functioning of, of God and doing all that stuff. And look at verse 19. If we want peace, if we want our world to calm down, look at this. And there was no war until the 35th year of the reign of Asa. He made these hard stands for God. He restored worship of God. He brought back the teaching priests. He, he got rid of the idols, and they had no more war inside or outside of their borders. It was awesome. Now, Romans 13, let's conclude this. Bless you. Romans 13, verses 1 through 7 speaks to you and I today in our attitudes towards our police officers. Let's read it. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good. And you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. So render therefore to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and honor for honor. He's talking about uh, our government officials. You know, they, they've, their job is to run this world right. They're having some problems, but we, we've kind of let our guard down, but we can take care of it, right? But what he's saying here is, 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 you know, we're not to rebel against the government, but we need to do our part, right? Uh, same with, with uh, the great men and women who serve on our police departments and stuff. Uh, verses 8 through 10 talks about how to coexist with, with, um, with our fellow human beings. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves one another, another has fulfilled the law. And it, it, it talks about the law. Drop down to verse 10. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Boy, there's sure lack of love in the world, isn't there? Now I want to close this down and just highlight these last few verses. I think they're very, very powerful. Now do this knowing the time that now is, is, is high time to wake out of sleep. Friends, the church has been asleep for the last 50 years. The church has, has allowed these things to so progress to where, where we're at now. Christians have, have avoided being involved in politics because we've taught ourselves to believe God would never allow that to happen to us when we've forsaken God. We need to awake out of sleep for now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. He's talking about the day of the Lord here and friends I believe that day is at hand. I believe it is very close. I believe, I believe that we will see the return of Jesus Christ. I'm truly convinced of that and if not well, we'll get to see it from heaven's viewpoint. That's cool, too. But because this day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly. Your Bible, if you read in a, a more modern translation, might even say decently, as in the day. Not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and in envy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Friends, I think it's challenging for us these words. And I don't know if you got anything out of it, but Friday and yesterday, 
I'd just been so personally troubled with everything that's going on not just Thursday night's events in Texas but but things that have been happening in our nation for for quite a while now and friends God is calling us as his people to rise up and to do something about it right we definitely have learned that we can't depend upon man we've got to depend upon God amen let's stand and let's pray let's conclude our time together Worship team, if you'll join me. Friends, today, you might have a mountain in your life that has nothing to do with what we spoke about today. Maybe you're facing a mountain of, of fear today. Maybe, maybe you've been abandoned and you don't know what, how you're even going to get through next week. You might have a, a mountain of, uh, of a health challenge. Maybe a mountain of financial challenge. It could be anything. Friends, God is the one who moves the mountains for us, right? He's calling us back to a holy life, and he wants to do a powerful and great thing in your life. And today, if you'll let him, he will do that. So as we go into to prayer today, uh, I'm just going to say a quick prayer and have the worship team play us a song, and then we're just going to open the altars up. And I'm going to ask Kelly and the fellas to join me up here and we're just going to open the altars up for prayer and invite you that if you have a prayer need or something going on in your life or maybe you just want to give God praise, we're going to invite you to come forward to do that. Amen? So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can gather together and study it. Lord, I pray that, Lord, in, in spite of my failings, in spite of me, Lord, I pray that you would take your word and you would challenge every heart. Father, I pray that today you would encourage us to be holy people. Father, I pray that today you would bring great healing and restoration. Father, I pray that today you'd bring great hope and great assurance that you are alive and well. We simply need to do our part. Father, whatever people are facing today, I ask that you would come and invade their hearts and their lives like never before. Father, would you use us as a church to do your will, to truly be lighthouses to a dark world? Father, break down walls of disunity that maybe we have built up. Father, bring us in, a, in agreement. Father, may we see the world as you see the world, and that is a world in deep need of you. Father, sometimes we get so holy-minded that, that we put up a wall of anger. Lord, break that wall. Break our hearts today. Move us to do what you'd have us to do to bring the message of the Lord Jesus Christ to this world. Father, once again, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I personally want to thank you for just allowing me to share. And Lord, you say that your word doesn't return void, but it accomplishes what it is sent out to do. Father, I would just humbly ask that today your word would, would accomplish all of our lives today for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.